It's the story of, of a country acting like a family together. Why you chose Patrick Payton's story? A lot of us have never heard about it. Father Payton believed that when people invited God into their home, that God would help people face in the same direction. That could be the thing that the values, things that would draw people out of themselves toward God, but in drawing them toward God and helping keeping them united and connected with one another as well. He just took it for granted that this was a value that would be important to everybody because that's what he grew up with and that's what he knew. But at the same time, he saw all the pressures that were happening in the family, even in 1941. In the face of that early challenge to families in the early 1940s, that's when he really started to say, folks, we have to pray together. Hey, welcome back, everyone. Now, one of the big discussions in this country is political divisions and also what it means when we're facing trials that seem insurmountable. Now, we can talk about, say, the risks we face as a nation with division, but one of the ways that we come together is through faith, is through culture, is through caring for each other. And a recent documentary touches on these principles. It's Pray, the Story of Patrick Payton. And here to speak with us today is Father David Guffey. He's the executive producer of that documentary, and he's also the national director of Family Theater Productions. Uh, Father, it's a real pleasure having you on Crossroads. Good to be with you, thank you. This documentary is really powerful, actually. It shows not only the power of faith to bring families together, but also it touches on into some of the political issues in the Philippines, in this case, where people peacefully overthrew a dictator, and even when soldiers were given orders to kill them, uh, through caring and compassion, even changed the soldiers' hearts and changed the whole country. It's, it's very powerful, actually. But I want to talk to you first about why you chose Patrick Payton's story. A lot of us have never heard about him. Patrick Payton is a priest of the Congregation of Holy Cross, and I belong to the same religious order, Roman Catholic religious order, so I kind of knew him from that. I started working here at Family Theater Productions in 2008, and in 2008 when I started working here, I started to learn a lot more about Patrick Payton. Uh, we have a room down in the basement that's now our studio that was filled with every format of video, 32 millimeter film, 16 millimeter film. Uh, a lot of it was shows that Father Payton produced. He produced over a thousand radio shows and about 150 TV shows or films. But a lot of it was footage of him giving talks, these impassioned talks, and his great passion was encouraging families to pray together. And he encouraged families to pray together because he believed that's what would hold people together. It would be bring the best life for the individuals in the family but that's what would also bring people in the church. That's what would also bring people in society together. And it just seemed like it was time the message get out again and people be reintroduced to Patrick Payton. We started digitizing all that content and got a wonderful producer named Megan Harrington, a great filmmaker, and put together this story that tells his story. But it also, in the film, gives little vignettes and stories of families who took Father Payton's message to heart and it talks about the fruit that that bore in, in their lives. We're really happy to get this film out to people. Well, and I would say that, you know, in traditional cultures, the family was regarded as the foundation of a society, uh, that social harmony begins with the family. No matter which country you're from, you go to ancient China, they said the same thing, even recently in China, maybe not under the Chinese Communist Party, but recently in China, they would say that compassion begins with filial piety. It begins in the household. And it's interesting to watch this documentary because you see this playing out. The same principle, you see it playing out, that by families repairing their divisions and coming together, this in this case under faith, that their entire lives start transforming. Absolutely. When it starts with the parents, the husband and the wife, the man and the woman, it's great when a man and woman are committed to one another. And that love can be strong and it's important that it is. But every relationship is going to have times that are difficult and stressful. Sometimes the stress is even success, you know, the, you know, the wild success and the ways that that can, can kind of draw people apart. It's important that they not only be committed to one another, but they be committed to something bigger. The marriage, but then the values that strengthen marriage and the, the things that keep people holding on to one another, even when 
there's stressors or, or hard times, even when there's really wildly successful times. Um, what is it that holds people together? And a common commitment to prayer, a common commitment to faith and values, and regularly sustaining that by practices within the home can be such a support for that family. And that just ripples out throughout all of society. You probably hear a lot of stories from people confessing to you or talking to you about the trials they're facing. And I would assume that some of that is, has informed you seeing a need for a film like this to, to relay this message. What are the trials you see people facing these days? It's a great question. First of all, there's just the challenge of people of values to find one another. Uh, every day I, I hear stories of people that really want to be in a relationship that's based on values as well as love and affection and all those things. But it's really hard for those people to find one another. So that's the first challenge. I think most people really do value their family and treasure their family and want the best for their family. Especially once kids start to be in school, when there's all kinds of activities, and parents busy with their things, there's ways that families can go a lot of different directions. So the challenge to find time to be with one another, the challenge to do quality things with one another, that kind of challenge can grow pretty intensely. The challenges of people having to grow up with one another. People grow, people change their careers, they grow, they change. How do they hold together? How, where, how do they stay together through those changes, uh, through the things that are important, and hold on to the things that are important? I start to see that when people's children get into middle school, high school, all of a sudden parents who had these wonderful, innocent little children are aware now of all they're being exposed to kind of the question, how do I pass on my values and things that are really important? It's amazing how at that point, often parents really realize how much they've been shaped and formed by a faith tradition, by values that came from their family, and how do I pass that on? I've seen sort of the people that are challenged by that, but the other part of that is, I live in residence and I serve at a large parish here in Los Angeles. I see people who are, are making it work. The families that are forming and raising children who do have ways of keeping connected, and a lot of times they're, they're not families that are perfect by any means, but they all include some kind of domestic rituals, including religious rituals, sometimes around holidays, around birthdays, and some kind of prayer traditions that would are things that they can turn to, the rock points in their life that they hold on to, even if other things are chaotic or confused. You see sort of the challenges and also some of the hope in the families that I encounter through the work that I do. I think this brings up a few points. One being the increasing solitude that people face as they continue to move away or lose family or friends. And as they get older, if they don't have something holding things together or a willingness to hold things together. You see this a lot with people as they get older as they have trouble making friends. I was reading Aristotle recently and he mm -hmm. talks about friendship and he says, you know, he kind of makes an argument that, even this is ancient times, you know, he's saying, as people get older, they have a harder time making friends because they lose interest in society. When they're younger, they believe more in society. And as they get older, they start losing faith in society a bit, essentially, right? right. And it brings up the point that, do you value friendship and human connection over let's say, the recognition of differences, when you start seeing there's differences in what you want to do and what you like to do versus what other people like to do and so on. Are you willing to overlook those differences to have that human connection? I think you do find as people get older that they become less willing to do that. This type of division, I think, can increase to the point where people live in real solitude. And I think that can be a big challenge for a lot of people. I'm curious if you see this as well. I do, and it's so easy to live an atomized life, a life separated. And I think the pandemic has exacerbated it because people haven't have chosen to or been required to, in some cases, stay close to home. Their groceries are delivered, everything comes to them, but the human connection is missing. If I sat and thought about it, I could tell you 13 households that I know of that have moved out of LA in the last year. Some of it was for economic reasons, but tied with the economic reasons was the realization that they were a long way from family. They were so far away from people that they cared about. You know, so grandparents could be closer to their children, so that young people that are starting a family could be closer to grandparents who could be part of children's lives. So I think there's forces that, you know, pull us apart into solitude. 
and there's things that draw us together. In my tradition, we believe that people are made for a relationship. There's this force within us that wants to be and needs to be connected with other people. I see a lot of that happening too. And the, the isolation and solitude, the problem of loneliness in the world, and maybe especially in a city like LA. I think it's harder to make friends in a city like LA than it is in a small town like where I, I grew up in a very small town in rural Midwest, but it's probably harder to make friends here than it is there. Uh, mm. Just because uh, it's so easy to be separated from people. Now, you mentioned with relationships that a relationship isn't just the good times. A relationship is the hard times and how you stay together through right. those hard times. And if we think about what that means, not just for a household and for the lessons you pass on to kids observing social relationships between the mother and the father. It brings up a bigger question of how do we maintain social harmony despite tensions. And if we are taught to run away when tensions come up or to break things off when tensions come up, that approach to difficulty, even though it may seem temporarily better, mm -hmm. can have really big implications. There's exceptions to it, of course, but it can have really big implications for society in general. You mentioned that people need a higher purpose that makes them want to stay together and fix things when trials come up. And I, I'm curious, you know, in your documentary you do touch on some of this. What were some of the messages that Father Peyton in particular had about this? Sure. One, uh, Father Peyton believed that when people invited God into their home, that God would help people face in the same direction. That could be the thing that the values, things that would draw people out of themselves toward God, but in drawing them toward God and helping keeping them united and connected with one another as well. Father Peyton believed that regular family prayer was key to that. And he had experienced that in his own family. He grew up in Northern Ireland, really a, a very poor farm family. He was the sixth of nine children. They all worked on the farm. He had, had about an eighth grade education. But he considered himself really rich in the sense that every night their family gathered in the kitchen and they knelt on the floor and they prayed the family rosary. And that so shaped his life and the life of his brothers and sisters that that kept them in harmony even with all the conflicts of working and living with one another in a very small space in Ireland. But then as they started to immigrate, which about half of them did, they still kept a bond, a sense of closeness, even though they were apart, connected through the prayer patterns that have become part of their life. That's just such an important and dominant part of Father Peyton's message. Looking at society and looking at families and mm. generations these days, there's a lot that divides us. You know, on the political spectrum, <laughs> I, I, right. I would like, I would, part of me wants to say we've never seen it so divided, but I think we have in history seen it just as divided, actually. Right. Um, which didn't always turn out that well, unfortunately. In terms of generations these days, I can look at the culture and the country I grew up in and look at kids these days, and they live in a different culture and a different country, even though we're in the same place. Because of the way entertainment has changed and music has changed and culture has changed and beliefs have changed, people generation to generation find themselves living in different cultures. And the cultures of each of those cultures creates a different society. And so we lack now a unifying idea for a country. We lack now a unifying culture, even between parents and children and grandchildren and so on. The development of family religious institutions that are cross-generational and that can help people transcend the other kinds of differences they are. I really think that in every age there's differences of personality or of temperament or background and often of political ideas. I think it gets exacerbated when the religious element of people's lives diminishes because other things take on importance of almost a religious nature. Mm. So that political thought almost becomes a religion with the same kind of passion and the same kind of attention of religious thought or religious thought would have in another age. To the degree to which we have institutions that can help hold people together in spite of differences is really going to be helpful. Places where people really have to come to terms with the differences and kind of work them out rather than just leaving and going to another organization. Pope John, John Paul II wrote a lot about Roman Catholic religious communities during his papacy. And one of his concerns was, was religious communities that admitted people to think the same, look the same. And he said, that's an affinity group. That's not a religious community. A religious community necessarily has diversity of gifts, diversity of how they stay together in community. That's part of what makes it strong. And what we're finding as well today 
is you mentioned that when people start losing this, they start to view government as it almost as the position that a lot of people view religion. Right. It's like if you lose that element, it's dominated by something else. Right. And, and some, for some people, and I was actually interested to find. I, you know, I've, I have a friend, for example, was with the Holy See, and he was telling me that you know, oh, Catholics, they believe in. Uh, social justice. I hear social justice and I'm thinking far left politics basically. It's, it's a different concept actually. It's the belief in social harmony and social good and caring for each other and caring for the poor. But the difference is in the approach. Rather than relying on government to do it, it's people out of goodwill wanting to and caring, wanting to help each other and wanting to care for each other. And not only that, but to help people stand on their own two feet again, that there is this humanitarian nature to this religious community idea. It's a concept that, funny enough, people think only government can fill these days. But in traditional societies, it had its place. Uh, but it was, sure. uh, it was out of goodwill from the grassroots. I'm curious, in terms of your own work, how do you see this playing out? You mentioned, for example, like the anchor being one of the symbols. Yeah, the anchor is a symbol of hope. Um, the pin that I wear is a cross with two anchors. The cross, our only hope, it's this motto of my, the religious community that I belong to. But I think you pick up on something really important that the body of Catholic social teaching has a range of really important elements. The respect and dignity of all human life from conception to natural death. The importance of the individual and that each person, their gifts, their talents are to be honored and help develop. Even a notion of work that Work is something that helps, serves the soul, so it's important. It's important not just for economics that everybody have a job, but it's important for their soul that they have a job because it's the way of connecting and contributing to the common good that's larger. So there's lots of parts of that, but the, the heart of Catholic social teaching is a sense of who God is, how God made the world, how God fashioned humanity in God's image. That's the heart and foundation of it. If people really connect with that vision of who God is, what the world is, and who people are, then it's really, it just flows out that they're, you'd act with charity, you'd act with fairness and justice towards others, that you'd act with concern for the common good. The body of Catholic social teaching, there's roots that go back to the Gospels and before that to the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, but it was really only articulated in the late 19th century in the way that we know it now, with sort of the pillars that are part of it. But I think before the 19th century, it didn't need as much articulation because it was just part of what a family was. It was just part of what a local community did. Not perfectly. I mean, obviously there's the sin in the world and there's people that ways that, there's always been ways that people can be selfish or self-destructive or destructive of others. It was the underpinning of societies, you know, this kind of, the sense and values that religious, Christianity, with the tradition that I know best, but really from the Jewish tradition, even Islam at its core, they all have that look at, you know, that sense of the value of family and its importance of being, that being the school of charity that sends them out into the world. Mm. Now, one thing we're dealing with, not just as a society, I think as a world right now, is a changing in the concept of what family is and, and a change in the concept of even relations between men and women and how we form relationships and what what the value of that actually is. Facing the want for a family or facing solitude or having a deeper need for something that maybe even they themselves don't recognize. Maybe a depression that could relate to this lack of uh, maybe human connection they start to face as they get older. I'm curious, what do you see in this? And tying back to Father Peyton, I mean, how did he regard the element of family, I guess? Sure. Yeah. It's interesting because Father Peyton really started his his work in, in 1941. He was ordained for two years and he had had a miraculous healing in his own life. He attributed to the intercession of the mother of Jesus and he wanted to repay her and family was so important to him. But one thing about Father Peyton is he just took it for granted that everybody would want this. He just took it for granted that this was a value that would be important to everybody because that's what he grew up with and that's what he knew. But at the same time, he saw all the pressures that were happening in the family, even in 1941. The ways that media were bringing different messages into a home, the, the variety of activities, the way that people work, the way people going off to war. In the face of that early challenge to families in the early 1940s, that's when he really started to say, folks, we have to pray together. We have to connect with God 
with our families, that we're doing it together. We're bound by that, that faith so that we can be together. I don't think we understand how great a transition it was out of World War II because there were a lot of people suffering, people who'd been in the war. The society changed because for the first time, large numbers of women were in the work world and how that would all work out. So there was a lot in flux. But his answer to the world then at the moment of trying to find peace in the world was peace comes when people pray together. Peace comes when people connect with God, connect with their, most, their deepest and most important values and do it with one another. So for him, you don't get to social justice by just looking at social justice, at least not in the Catholic sense. You really get to a sense of that by being connected to God first through prayer. But you touch on later in the documentary actually a political situation in the Philippines where you had the dictator come out and he rose through the ranks through a tyrant, I should say, come out and rose to the ranks through uh, what appeared to be voter fraud or you know, some kind of rigged election. People stood up against him peacefully, marching down the streets and so on, arm in arm, and he sent the military to kill them with orders to kill them. And people talked to the soldiers and through kindness turned them around, changed their hearts, and you know, not only avoided a violent outcome to all this, whether it be them trying to rise up against him or his orders to have soldiers come kill them, but they ended up changing the country. Why did you include that in this documentary? And what was the real message, I guess, of, of Father Peyton with that? It's the story of a country acting like a family together. Mm -hmm. um, it was probably in this room where Father Peyton was making the decision whether or not to go to Manila. He was an older man. He was in his 80s. He was sickly. And they had this rally planned in Manila, and he really wanted to go. He had a, quite a large following in Manila at that time. And they said, well, we'd love for you to come. We don't know how many people will show up. You know, there's lots going on, so and so on. But he went, and 1.2 million people show up for a rally in Manila. It, everybody was, was shocked. The footage just shows streets filled with people all through Manila. It was a rally where usually there'd be music, Father Peyton would give a talk, encourage and challenge and support people on family prayer rosary together. That was the exact time that the election was taking place with um, Ferdinand Marcos, with the woman that Corazon Aquino was the popular candidate. She was the candidate was going to bring democracy back to the Philippines. The election happened after the rally and Corazon Aquino won Duarte claimed that there was voter fraud and suppressed the election and there were people started to rally in the streets but they didn't rally with weapons they rallied with rosaries they took and they prayed the rosaries together at these rallies they were prayer rallies as much as they were political rallies well um, Marcos uh, sent troops into the street tanks into the street and the tanks you know get face to face with the rioters and uh, you know, many of these soldiers are people whose mothers and, and fathers and aunts and uncles, maybe even their children, were in the crowds praying the rosary. And everybody realized that they were in it together. Not a shot was fired. The troops essentially went back to base. And within a few weeks, uh, Marcos left the country. Cardinal, there was a famous, sadly named, wonderful man named Cardinal Sin of Manila who said it was prayers, especially the rosary that saved our country because we were together as one in that prayer. They, they had that in common that brought the other pieces of other factions together and that made for a peaceful transition of power. So it's a powerful moment. Cardinal Taglier, who now works at the Vatican, also he's, on, we, he's in the documentary and he too said that it's widely viewed in the Philippines that this movement for prayer together as the family of the Philippines helped bring about a peaceful revolution. Hmm. Now, we don't really see religious figures like Father Peyton anymore. The type of speeches he gave, hmm. what happened? Why is this, do you think? Father Peyton was kind of like a Catholic Billy Graham. <laughs> and I think it was an age where that kind of public expression of faith was more possible. We still do some rosary events, and we've had some big ones. In 2007, we had 50,000 people praying together at the Rose Bowl. And, Pasadena, the Archdiocese did a large rosary event. I don't think we've had speakers that were as public or as widely popular as Peyton was in his day or as Billy Graham was really throughout the entirety of his life. And I wonder why that is. One thing I would say about both Father Peyton and Billy Graham is they were intense men of integrity. Mm -hmm. I mean, Father Peyton 
raised millions of dollars was so driven, like single-heartedly driven to take this message around the world. In my religious community, people talk about having to remind him to buy new shoes because his shoes were getting too old because he just didn't pay attention that it wasn't for himself. And I think Billy Graham too, you know, there was real, and people recognize that. It's really hard to find religious figures who can sustain that level of integrity over the course of their lives. There's so many pressures and there's so many uh, ways that the forces of evil work on the lives of people that are public. And then people change too. I mean, whole families would come to these rallies. The family would have to work pretty hard to get their whole family to go to a rosary rally today. A lot of families would. The world has changed. But you probably see a different side of society than most of us see. Pe people talk to you on levels that they don't normally talk to each other on and confess to you things that normally they don't tell other people. I would assume you have a different perspective on the problems of society and the deeper trials people face that they mm -hmm. don't make public. I guess based on that understanding and based on, I guess, the work you've done, why did you choose to make this film? What issue did you see that you feel needed that remedy, I guess? I really hope and pray that people are inspired to make prayer part of their life and that people will pray with those that they love most, especially their families so that they can grow closer to God and grow closer to one another and so that they're fortified for all the challenges that they might meet. I suppose the second great, my prayer every day is I, I pray for people that are looking to create that kind of family. There are so many people of goodwill that have come to appreciate the values that are really important to them, often religious values. But for people to find one another in the world today can be such a challenge because you know, the social norms around dating and, and relationships are, are just either they're non-existent or they're not appealing to people of faith. I see a lot of that. And I, I see a lot of people who have suffered greatly from the so-called sexual revolution or kind of exploiting that part of life without connection to values or, or, or love or, or things that are deeper. There's all kinds of wounds, physical and soul and heart that I see, I, um, but uh, the, the, that's, that's the hard news. The good news is that there's so many people that have experienced that and now they know and they're looking for something deeper. And if you can take the start of a relationship and the formation of a relationship, add prayer and faith to that, prayer and values to that, really beautiful, wonderful things can happen that a lot of people's happiness or unhappiness does come from our relationships. Mm -hmm. But a lot of, you know, social harmony in the past was based on that. As, we, as I mentioned earlier, you know, they, they would say that compassion begins in the, in the household, begins with filial piety, and that the family was always seen as the bedrock of, of social stability, the bedrock of a society, right? It was mm -hmm. from the, the core foundation of the family. People are losing that, and I, th I think there's uh, a lot of pain people feel because of that, actually. Even if they don't attribute it to that, they feel it. The longing is certainly there, that people are longing to have those kinds of connections and don't really know how to bring it out, connect with it. There's a cost to it. To be in relationship with people, you're gonna find out the best and the worst of them, and how do you hold together even though you know the worst, even though you're expecting the best? and to stay with it and to grow with it, it help people grow within the relationship of the family, husbands and wives, children, the whole thing. I think a lot of people really long for that and long for the fruit that it can bear. You of course talked about Father Pate doing a lot to help families come closer together, in this case through prayer and through faith. Mm -hmm. Why do you think he focused on that? He'd seen what it had, Father Peyton focused on prayer because he had seen what it had done for his own life. He saw in all the places that he traveled in the world, of all the people that he met through the course of his life in the hundred some countries that he visited, that places where the family thrived, even if they were poor, there was hope, there was love, there was joy. And he, he knew the fruit of what prayer and faith could bring to any family, anywhere, in any time. Father David Guffey, real pleasure having you on Crossroads. Thank you, Joshua.